Welcome to The Bookcase. I am Kate Gibson. And I'm Charlie Gibson. We welcome you back to The Bookcase. And, and in this cast, we are calling all mothers and fathers, particularly of kids uh, between the ages of, I would say, 8 and 14 or 15. And Kate will tell you why. We have the prolific children's author, Stuart Gibbs, on the show today. And I'm so excited to have him on the show. He's written so many books that not even he is sure how many he's written. He believes when we come to the end of the calendar this year, he will have released 28. I'm not going to check him on that, but that's what he says. He has four or five different series going at the same time. There's Once Upon a Tim about a young kid's quest to be a knight. That probably skews in the eight to 10 year old area. There's the Moonbase Alpha series about families who live on the moon because NASA's testing out the viability of that. There's spy school where the CIA recruits kids to be spies in like middle school age. There's fun jungle where there's a kid who lives in the country's biggest zoo with his two zoologist parents and he solves mysteries about the animals. There's Charlie Thorne, who's a female middle schooler who travels around the world and solves mysteries. I mean, if those elevator pitches of those series don't sound like books that your kids would want to run out and read, then they just need a better sense of excitement. And when we said that Stuart Gibbs was coming on the podcast, there was one response that was particularly important to me Mm. and to Kate. My grandson Lang, he's now 12, is just Stuart Gibbs' biggest fan. And whenever he sees a new Stuart Gibbs book, and there are a lot of them coming out sort of rapid fire, he gets it, he reads it, and he loves it. So Kate and I are both in better stead with my grandson now, in better repute than we were before because Stuart Gibbs is with us. I don't ski. I don't play baseball. I haven't quite fit into Lang's wheelhouse yet. So the fact that I've gone up in his estimation by having on an author he loves for me is very exciting. (laughs) And we told Stuart Gibbs we wanted to do this podcast and air it at a time that he had a new book coming out. And he said, well, I have I have so many books coming out. I'm not exactly sure when I should tell you to put it on. But there's always going to be in the young adult section of your local bookstore. There's going to be a Stuart Gibbs section. His books are, I love them. Um, even, even at my advanced age, I get a big kick out of his books. Uh, as Kate mentioned, the new series being Once Upon a Tim, which comes with vocabulary lessons involved, as he'll explain our conversation with Stuart Gibbs. Stuart Gibbs, it's lovely to have you in the bookcase. My kids are really excited that you're on the show, as are my my nephews and my niece. So I want to start out by counting. If I'm counting correctly, you have not one, not two, not three, but four series going at the same time. How do you rotate them? How do you know, okay, it's been a while since I've visited this one. It's time for me to let those fans off the hook. How is that rotational process for you? I actually find that the rotational process really works for me. I like having a break between different series. I think if I was only writing one series, which I understand a lot of people do, I would I would kind of get, I don't know, I, I might get bored, I might get confused because you'd be at different points in two different books. Like you'd be on draft one and draft eight of two different books in the same series and not know where your characters were. But like I get to take a break from Spy School to go off and write Charlie Thorne or Once Upon a Tim. We've got 28 books, I think, out at the moment or soon to be out. I may be off by a few, but when do you have time to eat? <laughs> By the end of the year, I think I'll have 28 books out. But I officially am sort of at the point where I'm like, oh, wait, I wa- I'm not sure exactly. And yeah, I do like writing. I enjoy this. I, I'm much happier doing this than I would be, say, coal mining or something like that. <laughs> and I recognize I'm very lucky to get to do what I enjoy. You write for mostly middle school kids, although Once Upon a Tim skews a little bit younger, perhaps, and maybe Charlie Thorne skews maybe a little bit older. But what is it about the middle school brain that you're trying to reach? Is there something about that stage of development that fascinates you? I kind of ended up in this area by default. I was trying to write books for adults. And then agent said to me, had I ever thought about writing middle grade, which was kind of a new thing at the time. There wasn't this huge push in the middle grade. That person is now still my book agent because I thought, oh, that's actually a pretty good idea. And I, re- <laughs> I had all these ideas that I've been thinking, oh, I'll write a story with a murdered hippopotamus in a zoo for adults. And then I thought, oh, no, that's actually kind of the sort of thing that maybe uh, middle grade kids would like or doing like a spy comedy. I sort of ended up in here like not necessarily. I mean, the moment she said this, I went, oh, yeah, OK, that makes sense. For me, that might be my wheelhouse. And my, my son was two at the time. So I thought, oh, I can write something that 
he'll be able to read relatively soon. And then once I started getting into this world, I just found out that it's this wonderful world. Kids this age are such devoted readers, and they're so enthusiastic about reading. And if you think back to when you were this age, when you liked reading, you know, that you would find a book you liked and you'd read it not just once, but, you know, you'd read it over and over again, and then you'd read everything else that author had written. And so it's great to write the stage. It's great to meet those kids, too. I have a lot more contact with them than I would have ever imagined. They can write to me. School visits are a big part of the job, festivals. And so you get to meet these readers. They're all so wonderfully enthusiastic about books that you think, like, I, I don't want to write for any other age group. They're not this excitable. Kate mentioned all the series that you have going, Spy School, Fun Jungle, the Charlie Thorne books, and now you have Once Upon a Tim. But I'm wondering, do you have different ages in mind with each of the series, or is it basically all for the same subset? I don't like to write down to kids. So I'm ultimately always trying to write a book that I think I would actually appreciate reading myself or that other parents who might be reading books with their children would also appreciate that the kids, you know, if they have to go look up a word now and then or something like that, I don't have a problem with that. They don't seem to have a problem with that, really. They're happy to do it. In the Tim series, you look up the words for them. I wanted to keep using all these words that I loved. And so I thought, oh, if I use a word that I think they don't know, I'll put a little IQ booster in here and then they can learn the word, and then they can make the argument to their parents that they should be able to read this book and not something else, because it's educational. The book, I feel like, marks your first foray into something that's illustrative as well as text. Did the illustrations that Stacey Curtis did and the fact that it was playing a bigger role in the book change the way you wrote? I thought that would sort of change the kind of storytelling I could do, because then you could sort of direct people to look at a picture not have to describe something so much because you knew that Stacy would get stuck with that part of the job and having to <laughs> illustrate it. And it changed the storytelling in a way, but in a fun way. I mean, it was a new kind of way to tell a story. And I was excited to do that. And I should point out that I'm thrilled with the illustration Stacy's done. And what I love was that Stacy would put his own jokes into the drawings without fitting. I don't know who uh, the age of who's listening to this, but just to give you the level, the intellectual level I'm operating on here, one of the first test drawings Stacy did was of a troll, and he drew the troll scene from behind, and the troll's pants are slightly down, re revealing just a little bit of plumber butt there. <laughs> and I thought, like, yes, yes, this is this is my guy right here. Well, you're not above being a bit scatological, right. yes, even yes, in your exactly. writing. Yeah, because again, well, that's one of the other great things about writing for middle grade. I'm not saying that people of all ages don't actually enjoy this sort of humor, but at least kids who are in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, just totally honest about it. Like, yes, we enjoy this humor. <laughs> you can insert at this point a little vocabulary lesson on scatological and, yeah, and point out that it, that it allows you some freedom to be a little bit, uh, what's the word, Kate, to be a little potty humor is okay. A little anatomical humor is okay. This is the exact same conversation you had with the head of the Library of Congress, isn't it? It is, actually. We asked Carla Hayden exactly the same question. When, <laughs> as your kids were growing up, how did their interests shape your stories? Like, did your son come home and go, ooh, dad, we're learning about the moon this week and you gotta, ah, and we're learning about Egypt this week. And so you gotta, did you work the school curriculum into your books? So the second book in the Fun Jungle series was originally just going to be about this kidnapped koala, but my son really came home and he was, he, or I don't know, maybe he just was home and he said, Dad, oh my gosh, you have got to write about sharks because sharks have this terrible reputation. They have this reputation as just being these man eaters and going around killing everybody. And, you know, you got to do like some PR campaign for them. So this whole sort of shark uh, subplot ended up coming into the book. Uh, so this sort of stuff comes up a lot. I have gained new respect in the eyes of my grandson when he learned that you were going to be with us on the oh, podcast. Wow. So we asked him for a question and he said, you talked about your schedule, but Langston, is there some writing technique that you have that allows you to be so prolific? He used the word prolific, by the way. He absolutely used the word prolific. I outline, which is uh, not all authors do that. And I'll admit when I was probably Lang's age, I probably thought like Ugh, outlining, that doesn't sound like much fun at all. It is a very effective tool and it might seem like it takes some time out of just jumping into writing in the first place, but it certainly saves a tremendous amount of time if you have an outline because you know where your story is going to go and 
it doesn't mean you're locked into it. Doesn't mean you can't veer off the outline or be inspired to change things up a little bit. But it does give you a really good framework to stick to when you're writing. You talk in your afterwards about your kids being important editors for you. Now you've talked a little bit about how your kids give you ideas. What are your kids' roles in terms of editing, and how has that changed as they've grown? There was sort of this happy accident because I know I said it in the beginning, like I thought, oh, my son will read. I started writing the books, and I thought, oh, you know, it won't be that long till he can read them. But then I thought, oh no, I, I can, I can actually read the books to my kids. And so I had read Spy School to my son when he was quite young. And then I finished it and he said, when does the next book come out? And I said, nine months. And he said, oh, nine months. Like, I don't <laughs> wait nine months. And I thought, oh, you're the only child on earth who doesn't have to wait nine months. I can go print it out and I'll read you like an early draft of it. And so I read him this early draft. And even though like it had been through somewhat of the editing process, he was even at a young age catching continuity errors and things like that. So I thought, this is great. I get to be a parent and read to my kid, but also get some notes, too. My daughter really prides herself on catching points when I have overused a word. And she'll be like, oh, you used that word before, like uh, four chapters ago. She will sit there with a red pen. You work in lessons in the books, which is interesting. They are amusing. They're fun to read. But so, too, is there a serious side. For instance, with the 10th book in the Spy School series. I know you're talking a lot about two kids about the internet. Just one quote the internet is the place where reason and logic go to die. There's plenty of good information on it, but there's also a tremendous amount of disinformation. And the problem is lots of people can't tell the difference. When I was coming up with that, I wanted to create a new idea for a spy school book and I was working on one idea, on, and it happened to be January 6th of 2021, and things happened that day that I actually thought, I don't know that I can come up with anything like this, right? I mean, I, like, who would have known that would have happened? And I sort of really refocused, because I was thinking about this whole idea of, of how information is spread and what is actually, like, the greatest threat to people in any country right now. And I suddenly was seized by this idea that, this idea of disinformation and how easy it is to get disinformation to people and how people seem to be at odds of what the facts are, which probably has been going on throughout history, but suddenly seems to be we're in this new phase, a relatively new phase of, of that. So I do have an, uh, an agenda, but at the same time, I don't try to sledgehammer people with it. I try to like slip a quote like you just quoted in there and then kind of, you know, have some scatological humor or something, have somebody flip on a banana peel very quickly so that it doesn't feel overbearing to kids. And this is just something I've tried. I obviously have a, want to give lots of environmental issues in the Fun Jungle series. And I found that a little bit of fact goes a long way. I want to ask a general question about the way you feel about your middle school audience. I feel like the last few years in particular have been tough on that age. They've had a lot of reality thrust at them very, very, very quickly. In your opinion, has that changed your audience at all? Has it changed the way they think and the way they read? That's a good question. What I've been hearing from them or from their parents maybe is that they need escapism now more than ever. I've heard from a lot of kids because this was just an incredibly difficult series of years. And as tough as the pandemic was for adults, like this was just seminal for kids. They just lost two years of life when they've really maybe, you know, they're only 10 or 11 or 12. I had so many kids say like, this is how I got through this. They're like reading your books or reading other people's books and needing something to laugh about. They know that there's heavy stuff going on out there in the world with the pandemic and with environmental threats looming. And now, just when everything was going so well, the war in the Ukraine and such, it's a heavy time for kids that age. I know I'm throwing these lessons in there, but I, I'm really trying to make them laugh, too. Books with these sort of swab, very smart heroes who are about that age, who seem to know things before adults do, but you don't make adults look foolish, which I think is also important. So I appreciate the fact that you've provided 13-year-olds that don't look like they could fall on their face every minute of every day. 
you look back at the history of great detectives and Sherlock Holmes is put on a pedestal like Einstein is, right? It's the paragon of, of intelligence. When I was a kid, Encyclopedia Brown just stood out to me as this kid who was respected for being smart. And everybody came to him to solve their problems. And he always learned something from Encyclopedia. I learned what triskaidekaphobia was from Encyclopedia Brown, which is the fear of number 13, kids. So there wasn't an IQ booster written in there, but I learned it. What the great thing about mysteries is that there's stories where the smartest person wins. And I think that a lot of kids who are reading, they're smart kids. They need that because there is this awkwardness of being a, a preteen or, or just getting your tweens where I think a lot of the time the smart kids feel like they are not getting much attention. But being smart, that's the superpower that is going to get you through life, that is going to get you a job. That's what's going to make you successful uh, in life. And I think a lot of the time that sort of gets kind of forgotten. And so if you read a book where the smart kid is the hero, that hopefully is very empowering. One of the concerns that Kate and I want to address over the months on this podcast is how to get young people to put down their phones, take their eyes off their electronic devices and direct those eyes to books. Have you given much thought on how to do that, because that's essentially the business you're in. Yeah, I hear over and over again from people like, oh, I could never get my kid to read, and then they read your books, and now they'll read them. And I, I don't think that's anything special about my books. I think it's just that every kid out there has the right book is out there for them. It's just a question of getting that book into their hands. And so it, it is like my kids didn't necessarily just say, oh, we're going to read every single thing that we get. So I think it's partly just building this enthusiasm for reading, which I think, I mean, that a lot of that falls onto uh, their teachers and their librarians in, in elementary school. But I, I think parents need to sort of be there to back that up and sort of say, like, let's find something that excites you. Now, I will say that suddenly over the past two years, there's been this explosion in graphic novels and I think a lot of that is being driven by the fact that graphic, like uh, the stigma has sort of vanished from the graphic novel, that people realize it, it's easier to get their kid to read a graphic novel, maybe than that it's less daunting than a, a chapter book. And it's a good stepping stone. My publisher and I are jumping into this world with graphic novels of adaptations of the Spy School series and soon to come, uh, hopefully, some of my other series. But I'll also say one of the other things that sadly, I think what happens is that you do have these kids who get excited about reading in elementary school, and then it peters out at some point. And I think that there does become this idea that reading is supposed to be very serious. And a lot of the time, the books that they have to read in middle school, especially high school, are sort of like, oh, like reading is this important thing. And the fun drains out of it. You know, one could tell people that there's no shame in reading something that's just fun and light, that if, as long as you're reading something that's that's great. You know, if anybody who designs high school curriculums is listening, the graphic novel and fun thing can replace the Scarlet Letter. That would be great. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of stories that are being taught or novels are being taught that, you know, are very serious and dour. I did not enjoy the Scarlet Letter a whole lot when I was in high school. I mean, look, there's so much great literature for teens being written now. And I do hear about a lot of schools pivoting and shifting to teaching books like by Angie Thomas or Jason Reynolds and many, many other great authors. Uh, and I think that's wonderful. There's amazing work being done now. Even though it's maybe targeted towards teenagers does not mean that it is not on the level of anything ever written by Nathaniel Hawthorne or, uh, or William Shakespeare. I was in the park with my eight-year-old daughter and her friend when they were like, I don't know, five. And out of nowhere, Shakespeare in the park set up and they started doing Taming of the Shrew or whatever. And I heard the one little girl say to the other little girl, what are they talking about? I don't understand. <laughs> and my daughter turned to her friend and goes, I don't know, but they're feeling some very big feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great description of Shakespeare. It is, it is, yeah. This is Good Morning America. Some exciting news to share from my former colleagues at Good Morning America. You can now listen to GMA whenever you like. Good Morning America is now available as a podcast. And so you can take Robin, George, Michael, Ginger, and the rest of the crew with you in the car, to the gym, basically anywhere you want. Good Morning America, the podcast, available for free wherever you listen.
rapid fire Stuart Gibbs number one book e-reader or audio oh uh, I'm more an e-reader do you spend more time reading or writing I probably spend more time writing actually yeah most influential book in your life Oh boy, The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin, which is like a master class in mystery construction and character development. I reread quite often because it's just brilliant. Was there a specific book that made you think, I want to write? I really want to be able to do what this author has done. I was writing for as long as I can remember. So I can actually remember from that age just I mean, Dr. Seuss was probably what I was trying to (laughs) emulate as a kid, because that was just what I wanted to do. So whatever, I mean, just books in general, just the fact that somebody was writing stories and other people were getting to read them. I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. Favorite book to read to your kids? Oh, man. Well, I, there's almost nothing better than reading your own book to your kids. That sounds very self-serving, but it's just this amazing thing. I mean, it's the, this part of being an author for kids that I didn't necessarily think about. And then to get to do that, that was just phenomenal. But what actually impresses my kids more now, this is not a short answer, long answer, is that I know other authors. And so they can meet other, like, and I can read other people's books to them that they've met. And so I have all these great friends who are authors. And then to get to read my friends' books to them is really cool. And as I said, what impresses my grandchildren is now that I've talked to Stuart Kim's. Is there a revered book that you're really sorry you read that you just didn't like? Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> so many. Um, Moby Dick. Oh, my gosh. I have tried reading that book twice, like thinking, like, maybe I didn't get it. And, you know, like the New York Times always has that thing where everybody's saying, like, oh, here are the books on my nightstand. And I'm like, are you, aren't these people being honest? Because they're always talking about, like, their favorite authors being, you know, some brilliant poet. And I'm like, no, man, I like Carl Hyacin and Douglas Adams grew up like revering like Michael Crichton. And I'm like, those, I just like reading authors who are just spinning a great story. Do you put down a book if you don't like it? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I really feel like that's a lesson people need to know is if you're not enjoying a book, stop reading the book. Do you dog ear the pages? Do you underline? Oh, no, 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 no. First of all, part of my stock and trade, any middle grade author, we have to hand out bookmarks. And my kids still dog ear the pages. And I'm like, what? We have bookmarks coming out of our ears here. Why are you dog ear the pages of a book? Uh, this is a question we stole from Stephen Colbert, but uh, but we love it. In, in five words, describe what you want the rest of your life to be. Oh, Colbert, man. Uh, I want to be on Colbert. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. So it's time on the podcast where we talk about what we've learned. So I'm going to go off on my long monologue. And then if there's anything left over to say, I'll call on my father to say it. One of the things I love about Stuart Gibbs is he's a writer that I would have loved to have read at his audience ideal ages, because I remember books that I read at that age that didn't talk down to me, that made me laugh. And I think in some cases made you and mom laugh, dad. Books like Banicula, which is about the bunny vampire who sucks the juice out of vegetables. There's The Phantom Toll Booth, which plays very adult games with words, which I love and I'm reading to my daughter a second time. There's Super Fudge, which I think the younger brother at one point eats his older brother's turtle. There are great examples of this genre where authors don't talk down to kids and I think as a result, create classic books that last forever. And if you don't have a kid who's reading Stuart Gibbs, then you've probably seen his books on the subway or a bus or in the backpack of a kid. You know, Spy School's got the iconic fedora hat, trench coat wearing, sneaker wearing covers. You can't miss Stuart Gibbs. And I love it because he's a champion for young people's reading. And I think what became clear in our conversation, at least I've always thought, to be really appealing to kids like that and to get their sense of humor, sometimes which can be a little potty oriented sometimes of which can be not but kids have such a wide imagination i think you have to be a big kid yourself to Mm. write books that appeal to that age group and as i say in our conversation i thought you got a sense that Stuart gibbs certainly was that that he has that 
inner kid in him that lets him be as successful and has made him so successful in all of the books that he has published and will continue to publish because all these series seem to me to have a future. Sometimes he ends them. Sometimes he gets new series, but his books are always appealing. You're right. He has a sense of fun that comes through in his writing. I think you get the sense that he is having almost as much fun writing it as you are reading it. And that mutual joy, I think, makes it really fun to read his books. So it would be only appropriate if we're going to marry Stuart Gibbs to an independent bookstore that we pick one that has a large, very large children's section and is primarily aimed at children and young adults. The Little Shop of Stories is in Decatur, Georgia, and they have some wonderful ways to appeal to kids. I think this is a a good lesson for all bookstores if they haven't thought of the same things that are carried out at Little Shop of Stories. Justin Calusi Estes, who is the manager of Little Shop of Stories in Decatur, Georgia. Justin Calusi Estes, who is manager of the Little Shop of Stories in Decatur, Georgia. And you have some wonderful approaches. First of all, people should know the little in Little Shop of Stories is very important in that title because you're what, about 80% kids books? Yes. Your average bookstore that most people are familiar with is typically 75% general interest and kids sections can be 20 to 30%. We're the flip of that. We are majority kids' books. We do have a solid adult section that is mostly new, like things that have come out in the last year or so in paperback or hardback. Yeah, our kids' section is broken up quite granular across the store. I want to ask you about both your book clubs and your summer camps, but I want to start with your summer camps. First of all, this year you had Dungeons and Dragons, you had Make Your Own Myth, you had Camp Hogwarts. Is it just kind of like staff members going, I think it would be fun to make a big cardboard castle this year? Like, how did those come about? You've nailed it. We've done summer camps since we began. We began in 2005 and summer camps, the space we opened up in originally had a large back room where we had birthday parties and we did camps. And it's always just been what interests the staff. Sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. (laughs) Anybody hearing this knows that book clubs become a good discipline for reading a book and community. But I wanted us to make sure we had that for kids. So we're starting back up my first book club, which is a book club for kids that are just starting to read. So I love that. We came up with kind of a formula for how to get little kids. We're talking about like kindergarten, first grade to talk about books. And it's, you know, who are the main characters? Is there a conflict? What was your favorite part? We have some kind of activity or game and we try and read another book that we connected just some way kind of thematically or maybe they both have bears or you know something i just think that helps in terms of getting kids thinking about the way they're reading and what they're reading kate mentioned the summer camps and you're talking about book clubs for kids the wonderful thing that i attracted me about little shop of stories is that you have come up with so many innovative ways to integrate into the community. Talk about some of those. We partner with local businesses that have a candy shop and an ice cream place and a cupcake place. We challenge kids to hit certain goals in reading. We measure it by hours. That is for solid readers. So for every 10 hours that they read, they get a coupon for a treat from a local business, whether it's gummies from the local candy shop or cupcakes from the cupcake shop or ice cream from the ice cream place. If they reach 40 hours, they get invited at the end of summer to our summer reading party. This just gets so many people excited. They go and they discover these other businesses. Parents have told us, thank you so much. My kid was kind of an okay reader, but this really gave them a goal and they got really into it. This year, we added a business that provides allergen-free treats. So she's a bakery and she worked with each family to try and provide something. And we also have one for adults that's a bingo card that if they get bingo, they get a free book. And we have one for kids that aren't reading yet. That one's more family oriented. And that one, we provide a blank calendar and stickers and they get to put a sticker 
on the calendar for every day that they read. And then for every 20 days, they get a similar kind of coupon for another treat from another local business. So let's get into titles. What was your favorite book to read to your kids? Uh, My favorite book to read to my kids. (laughs) Okay. Two different ones. One was not my favorite, but my favorite experience. One of the last things I read to my son before he got too old. Hopefully we have a time where we're reading to one another again, but I was reading the BFG by Roald Dahl. And I decided I would give the, I'd, it had been a long time since I'd read that book. And I was like, I'll give the giants voices. And they were all like this, you know, and then I didn't realize how much dialogue, not only the main giant has, but how many giants are in there talking. And it just blew out my throat. Yes. I have the same problem. I have the same problem with Harry Potter and I have a problem with Alice in Wonderland because in the last book, they all come back and then they're all assembled for the trial. When you have to remember all the voices you Yes. Did. And so I start reading them and my daughter will go, no, he was Irish. <laughs> I used to, with, you know what, uh, Dr. Seuss is always longer than you ever remember. And yes! books like Fox and Sock, the pair of pages are united, but not necessarily. Once you flip the page, it's kind of like you can jump into, because it's just chaos, right? And so I used to hold pages together and flip, and my oldest Nora would say, Daddy, that's not, that's not how it <laughs> There are new pages here. (laughs) And you go, shoot. Thank you so much, Justin, at Little Shop of Stories for talking to us. I appreciate it very, very much. And uh, we will talk again soon, I hope. Absolutely. This has been so delightful. I can't wait for further conversations. Kate, I loved all the activities they have. Uh, The idea of a summer camp for readers, I think, is a wonderful idea for a bookstore like Little Shop of Stories that's aimed at kids. Well, I never learned how to play Dungeons and Dragons because, you know, well, in my day, that was something the nerds did. But anyway, I never learned to play Dungeons and Dragons. But if I was going to play, I would want to play against Justin. I love talking to people who work in kids sections or in kids bookstores because they all take such, I mean, they, there aren't that many people who sort of clock in and clock out and go, hey, yeah, I hate my job. It sucks. It's so boring. Nobody gets into selling books to kids because they're not excited about it. I love talking to children's booksellers. Yeah, it's and it's interesting that, that there is this, I, I think, a phenomenon that we're trying to get kids off of their digital devices, off of the screens, and get their eyes into books. And it would seem to be a very difficult thing when you look at a restaurant or when you look at a kid on a bus or whatever, he's always got his phone in front of his head, in his face. But it, the, the, the young adult section, the kids sections of bookstores all seem to be expanding to me. There seems to be more and more space in bookstores devoted uh, to kids' books. And, and that's, I think, a very positive trend. Uh, and maybe, who knows, maybe the the, using the screens and the phones will eventually direct them into books. There's now a lot of graphic novels that are appealing to kids. And as I say, there are both traditional books that their parents read and new ones coming out all the time, like Stuart Gibbs. Anyway, we appreciate talking to Stuart Gibbs. To get off the air, we want to, uh, as always, identify and uh, thank the people who made this podcast. The Bookcase is a production of ABC Audio, produced by David Canada in conjunction with SureCam Productions. Brenda Salinas Baker is our senior producer. Liz Alessi is our executive producer. And we give special thanks to Josh Cohan, Elizabeth Russo, Nania McLean, and Cameron Chertavian. No, to Mark said, outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. And inside of a dog, it's too dark to read.